there are many subtle points, but again, I insist that uh, there is no conceptual problems, and the picture I have uh, presented here is uh, uh, kind of the most economical way to describe uh, oscillations without facing any conceptual problems. Well, I can add a little bit more confusion, saying that even energy momentum are not conserved in this picture. Um, and sometimes you need to take into account this. And the point is, we have this kind of situation when we have localization, right? We have localization of the sources and also localization of the detector. When you do localization, which means that you create something, quantum system, which should have some kind of finite size, which means that you face here uncertainty relation immediately. Of course, energy and momentum are conserved if you consider all the system, also the walls or something which produces localization. In all the system, energy and momentum are conserved. However, if you truncate description saying, okay, now I'm, I'm just focused on neutrinos only, or probably some particles which are accompanying neutrinos, then sometimes you may take, may, uh, take into account also uncertainty principle and energy momentum uh, violation related to finite size of the production region. So now let's back to, to, uh, to my lecture. And uh, yesterday it was some question, probably it has some interest uh, to, 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 to others. I have shown this uh, summary of the results on solar neutrinos. And the question was how we determine mass, square difference, and mixing angles from here. Remember, we discussed how we determine this from oscillatory picture. So uh, here you see theoretical curves, two, which correspond to two different delta m square. So you see here we have sensitivity to delta m square, and if you change delta m square, this curve moves. So this is the way how we are fixing delta m square or extracting delta m square from our solar neutrino data. The probability here just corresponds to sine square theta 1, 2. So if you are measuring this asymptotic value, immediately determine this one to mixing. And also the probability here uh, is given essentially to vacuum oscillations, and the formula is 1 minus this 1 half sine square 2 theta. By the way, it was always question that if you take into account three neutrinos, right? So here's just two neutrino problem. If you uh, also include the third neutrino in analysis, then uh, the change is very little. So you should just add to this probability two factors. Cosine one three to the fourth power. Then this probability which we are discussing here, P2, actually this is uh, uh, which takes into account also this uh, one three mixing plus sine one three to the fourth. So this is very close to one, this is very small and usually can be neglected, and this is how we connect the probability in three neutrino case with the probability of two neutrino oscillations. So there's no problem to include immediately one three mix. So in some slides before and what you will see next, uh, I will also mention two different mass hierarchies. So when we are saying about two different mass hierarchies, we mean the following. This type of the spectrum I have already described before, and this refers to normal mass hierarchy case, and actually the states can be enumerated by amount of electron flavor in a given state. So let us call the state number one, the one which has the biggest amount of electron flavor. Second state has uh, intermediate one, and the third state is the one which has the smallest amount of electron flavor, right? So there is no kind of ambiguity what to call neutrino one, neutrino, neutrino two, neutrino three. Now, inverted mass hierarchy case corresponds when the third neutrino is the lightest one. And two others with a big amount of uh, electron flavor are the, uh, have the bigger mass. Again, from oscillations, immediately we are extracting mass square difference. Remember this. Now, it's not complete permutation of this picture because the ordering of the first state and the second state is the same as here. And actually, this ordering uh, is determined or fixed by solar neutrinos. If you would have opposite, then you would not have resonance or adiaboticity conversion, which I have discussed before. And suppression would be much weaker than you saw in the previous slide, where suppression is something like one-third 
at high energies. So hierarchy of elements one and two are fi is fixed by solar neutrino data. So we actually now consider it one, two sector. Uh, and one, two sector sometimes some, sometime is referred as a solar neutrino. So this is how delta m square one, two and n sine square theta one, two are fixed from solar neutrino data and from Kamland. So these two experiments allow us to extract these two parameters. So let's go to atmospheric neutrinos. Atmospheric neutrinos are produced in interactions of cosmic rays with a nuclei in atmosphere. So in these interactions, uh, many secondary particles are produced, and in particular, pi mesons, k mesons, charm mesons, and, and others, depending on energy. Then pines decay into muon and muon neutrino, and muon in turn decays into electron, muon neutrino, and electron neutrino. In this chain, we produce two muon neutrinos and one electron neutrino, and uh, the ratio of fluxes, at least at low energies, where these processes dominate, is uh, uh, two. So the number of muon neutrinos is two times bigger than the number of electron neutrinos. Actually, this is a very important quantity, and uh, uh, many observations actually uh, can be explained taking into account this ratio. At higher energies, also these processes, actually even at not very high, but at higher energies, these processes become more uh, also important. At very high energies, uh, the production of charm mesons and uh, uh, their uh, decays into neutrinos give some contribution. Till now, we haven't observed, though, in atmospheric neutrino, this decay. They should actually give probably even dominant flux in atmospheric neutrino at very high energies, like in PEV range, the range where we are uh, observing uh, cosmic neutrinos now. So at high energies, at least, this uh, cosmic rays produce isotropic, essentially, flux of muon neutrinos, which actually comes from different directions. And so if your detector is here, you detect neutrinos from everywhere. So it's from, from all, all the directions. And uh, in some cases, neutrino crosses the core of the Earth. In some cases, it's just atmospheric neutrino. OK? Now, these are fluxes of atmospheric neutrinos. This is the energy scale, the, the flux multiplied by energy cube. So in fact, if you just uh, show the fluxes, they have maximum somewhere here near one GeV, and then very fast uh, uh, decrease of the fluxes, essentially like uh, energy into fifth power. Uh, you see the dominant components, especially for at high energies, are muon neutrinos and muon antineutrinos, and uh, much lower flux of electron neutrinos and electron antineutrinos. And the point is, these electron neutrinos are produced in decay of muons. And uh, so muons have lifetime, which is two orders of magnitude bigger than pine, right? And so pine has enough time to, to decay. And muons, especially at high energies, they have no time to decay. They just hit uh, uh, the surface of the Earth and so do not produce neutrinos. So they degrade energy, degrade. They produce neutrinos. However, the energy is much lower. This is the, the so-called flavor ratio. And you see we are producing all uh, uh, four neutrino species. Actually, at very, very high energies, also tau neutrinos should be produced in the origin. Huh? So uh, this is what we have. And these are the ratio of different fluxes. So the flux is around two of muon uh, and electron neutrinos. And then this uh, flux increases. This ratio increases. Now, atmospheric neutrinos have very uh, an enormous physics potential because uh, the energy range is huge, say, from 0 0.01 uh, GeV up to 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 GeVs. The baseline we are studying is just comparable with diameter of the Earth is one so, uh, 13,000 kilometers. Matter effect is present. And actually, uh, these neutrinos feel all these profile and features of density profile of the Earth. So we have neutrinos of uh, all neutrino, of all the types, electron, muon. And uh, also, we have neutrinos and antineutrinos. And tau neutrinos are produced copiously through oscillations. So achievements. We, you know that the first discovery of oscillations has taken into account in atmospheric neutrinos. The first 
statement that we see oscillations was done uh, studying atmospheric neutrinos. And then atmospheric neutrinos allowed us to measure 2-3 uh, mixing and 2-3 uh, mass splitting. And uh, nowadays, and even in early days, we are using atmospheric neutrinos to search for new physics beyond the standard model. And the program is to search for sterile neutrinos. And there are a number of bounds obtained on the properties of sterile neutrinos to search for non-standard interactions, violation of fundamental symmetries like CPT or Lorentz invariance. Now, this just to show the quality of the data on atmospheric neutrinos. What has been observed? It was observed the deficit of muon neutrino flux and no deficit of electron neutrino flux. And you see here zenith angle distributions of different type of the events. For instance, this is uh, uh, events at, in sub GeV range. So these are zenith angle distribution of events in different energy regions. So uh, here is a low energy new mu like events. And you see this is what is predicted and that was observed. And the uh, blue line corresponds to the best feed point uh, uh, when you use certain values of parameters. So you extract from here 2, 3 mixing angle and 2, 3 uh, mass split. So you see here the deficit. This is also some other type of the events. And uh, the difference is uh, here, when you, the biggest one, when neutrinos are coming from down. So they have big uh, baseline. Uh, here, at uh, close to vertical direction, the effect is very small because the distance from the point when neutrinos are produced something like 10, 20 kilometers. And there, from downstairs, it's something like 13,000 kilometers. And you see this kind of very um, profound uh, effect of oscillation. This is for higher energy events. And again, so this is what is expected without oscillations, and this is what you observe. Uh, in, in the experiments. So the data are dominated by Super Kamiakanta. So these are the data from Super Kamiakanta. Uh, so these are even higher energy, uh, uh, muon-like mu events, as we are saying. Again, there is a deficit and certain change with energy range and the type of events. So this is, for instance, partially contained muon events, which means that something is produced but go out of the detector. And so you do not see all the track. And that corresponds to higher energies. In contrast to E-like events, like here, for instance, there's a good agreement. So it looks that electron neutrinos are not uh, the subject of oscillation. They do not participate in oscillations. In contrast to muon events. And the interpretation was that this deficit is because of oscillations of muon neutrinos into tau neutrinos. So that's interpretation. And we extract from here experimental results. Yeah, of values of mixing angles and mass square differences. Apart from super Kamiakanda, now this type, new type of the experiments provides with very nice experimental data. So you see here the ice cube detector, and I will speak about this detector uh, uh, also a bit later. Uh, so what is this? This is in Antarctica. And you see here, there's the surface, the ice, and this is the ice. The ice has the width something like three kilometers in some places in Antarctica. And uh, here you see strings. And uh, the strings, two strings, the so-called digital optical models are attached. Essentially, these are kind of photo PMT, photomultipliers, in the sphere with some electronics inside. So it's already sends to the surface elaborated signal. There are 86 strings here, and the total volume is one kilometer. So you can see here the uh, two refill. Uh, uh, each of these strings contains something like 60 models. This is ice cube detector. Now, inside ice cube detector, there's a deep core. And deep core detector is just more strings. So you have, um, you have higher density of photomultipliers. When you have higher density of photomultipliers, you reduce the threshold. So if ice cube can detect events above 100 GeVs, the energy release, the deep core can detect events down to 10 to 15 GeVs. 
And now we are discussing even more dense array pingu to determine the mass hierarchy of neutrinos, which will have the energy threshold 3 GeVs. And this pingu detector, I will speak a little bit more later, will have even denser array of, uh, of the strings and uh, photomultipliers, something like 40 strings more in the smaller volume of this type. And about 96, uh, sorry, 86 uh, photomultipliers or 96 each string, yeah? Yes, yeah. So one inside, actually the ping will probably will take approximately the same volume as this near part of, uh, uh, lower part of deep core. Actually this, uh, this layer has no photomultipliers because of dust. Actually it's interesting uh, geological studies and uh, the ice was accumulated and you see some layers with dust when it was epoch of uh, you know, volcanic uh, activity, and so there's a dust related to this activity. Now, this is the result which Deep Core released uh, quite recently, and so it was the end of last year, and they see also oscillation. So what they detect? They detect uh, 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 muons produced by uh, muon neutrinos charge current interactions. So muon neutrinos, atmospheric interact in the, in the detector, produce muons, and these muons are detected by a deep core, okay? So uh, here you see number of events as a function of reconstructed energy in say, uh, uh, this is L over E, L over E is just the factor which enters the phase, the phase is proportional to this. And so you expect oscillatory picture, and this is precisely what they see. So this is what is expected without oscillations, and this is with oscillations. Of course, you are not covering many periods, it's just one period, essentially, of the oscillations. And this is the ratio of uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is observed to what is expected. And you see here, clear with high uh, sensitivity, the deficit of the signal here, just because of muon neutrinos partially are transformed to tau neutrinos, and tau neutrinos produce signal, but not what you expect here. So here is determination of uh, uh, parameters, delta m squared 3, 2, and uh, this is sine squared theta 2, 3, and you see results from different experiments. These are more or less uh, the data which we are getting, so uh, uh, delta m squared is something like 2.5. I mean, if you add some other experiment, this is 2.7 comes from this experiment. But you see the accuracy of, uh, of deep core uh, is comparable with accuracy of other experiments. I think this one is uh, from T to K. Uh, this is an uh, accelerator experiment, and this one from Super Kamiakande uh, detector. And this is from MINUS. You see here, so there's a good agreement of all the data, and uh, what they show is that the mixing, 2 3 mixing, is close to maximum. Remember, we had already this in the picture before, the mixing is close to maximum, although some kind of uh, still a uh, wide range allowed. Now, what are problems and what is the future of these studies? First of all, nowadays we are going to very preci precise measurements in atmospheric neutrinos. And remember, this is a cheap si uh, signal. Now, no need to produce accelerators, which now is very costly. So this is, you know, the nature gift for us. But the problem is that we need to understand these fluxes very well. And now, for future experiments, we need to, to have a knowledge of these fluxes with uh, say 1%, 2% level accuracy if you want to determine mass hierarchy and CP violation, which I will speak about. So this is a serious issue because it looks that everything is known. Of course, you don't know very precisely the cosmic ray fluxes, but at low energies, you, mo you even can measure this, uh, uh, these fluxes. Uh, but then you need to develop, to develop your algorithm to compute cascades, because you have actually in atmosphere the cascades, and to compute these fluxes. Then things become not so trivial. But anyway, uh, so oh, now this is one of the uh, important activities to make really very precise predictions of the fluxes. This is kind of next step in, uh, in this business. Because if you have just, uh, say, want to have 10, 20% accuracy, this is one story. But if you want to go to, say, 1% level, 2%, you need to take into account various effects, new ones, and processes, etc. Now, uh, what we expect from uh, 
from this usage of atmospheric neutrinos, determination of mass hierarchy, measurements of CP phase, and search for new physics, which I have already mentioned. In what are experiments, super K still continue to operate. Now, deep core will release more data, and ice cube actually, ice cube measures this atmospheric neutrino fluxes at higher energies, even so, up to this PEV range where cosmic neutrinos already appear. So, the flux of electron and muon neutrinos is now measured up to this very high energies. Oscillations effects actually show up at lower energies. There is no big oscillation effect at high energies, except for if there are sterile neutrinos. If there are sterile neutrinos, say, in the range of one electron volt mass, then they sh can, should show up at this experiment in ice cube at energies few TeVs. And so we are expecting analysis from uh, ice cube now, which will put, so I hope, very stringent bound on these sterile neutrinos. You may ask me, I can elaborate on this more. So then Pingu and Orca, these are kind of experiments which are quite similar. Orca probably will be in Mediterranean here. So this one, as I explained already, in Antarctica. And uh, so the aim is to determine mass hierarchy using atmospheric neutrino. So you need to create just detector, good detector, and uh, have good prediction for uh, atmospheric neutrino fluxes. Although here, in the case of hierarchy, you may not need to have very precise uh, flux knowledge. Then hyper -Kamiakanda. This is next project after super -Kamiakanda, which may probably start to operate in 10 years. And they uh, will have bigger volumes, also have very nice capacities to have flavor identification, measurements of energy. And so they will, of course, contribute. Then the, the very, you know, future projects are like MICA or Super Pingu to measure CP violation. And this one, again, in Antarctica, to have very low threshold to be sensitive to supernova neutrinos and even to solar neutrinos. Accelerator neutrinos. So this is actually a nice event in, uh, uh, in Super K. Now it's, it's really kind of artistic, you know, although this is techniques, you know, techniques of detection, but pictures are really amazing. The colors actually, uh, 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 they show the, the timing. So the, the signal probably uh, started from here and then developed in the green, and these are the later times. And so you see here these dots, these are photomultipliers, uh, which detect this, this event. And this is high energy event, I think. Now, uh, what are the sources of neutrinos in accelerators? It's, you, you usually have proton nuclear collision, again, in which you are producing fine K mesons, also charm mesons. And uh, <clears throat> so then you uh, create the fluxes of neutrinos, uh, uh, mostly uh, muon neutrinos, but also uh, electron neutrinos. And now you can uh, separate neutrinos and antineutrinos by just using magnetic fields. So you can, say, remove pi plus, and then you have the case of pi minus, or vice versa. So uh, accelerator neutrinos fluxes are considered the fluxes which you can manage. You know, it's, it's not like atmospheric. It's given, that's it. You cannot do anything. But here we can play with this. Important thing, what you can do with, uh, uh, with uh, accelerator fluxes, you can change even the energy range or the spectrum First of all, the energy spectrum is determined by the original protons, right? If you have uh, initially uh, very high uh, energy protons, they will produce higher energy pions and neutrinos. Not only this, now you can use the following. Actually, you produce pions, and pions decay. And the beam, when it propagates long distance, becomes very wide, right? So actually, uh, transverse momentum is determined by the mass of the pion because everything else is just in, in this form, direct. But even if you take this momentum of energy which uh, uh, transverse from the pi and decay, which is something like, say, 30 MeVs, at the distance of, say, 10, kil 10 kilometers or 100 kilometers, the beam becomes very big. It's just kilometer size. You can put your detector not in the center, but off axis. And that actually changes the spectrum. And you see here the spectrum of neutrinos produced at different uh, angles from precise direction to the, to the source. So you can produce narrow beam being, uh, uh, not being out of axis. 
Of course, you are losing somehow sensitivity to some extent, but you can play with this if you need really to have this, this type of the, of the spectrum. Here you see typical spectrum, uh, energy spectrum. Actually, this is from T to K of different neutrino species. So this is what you are producing. And you see the average energy is somehow 0.6 GeVs. Now, present day operating experiments are T to K. And this is long baseline experiment with distance 295 kilometers. Um, uh, the neutrino beam is produced at uh, J-Park complex, accelerator complex. So here are the, some rings, and then also there is a front detector. And in all these experiments, usually they have near detector or front detector so that you measure the flux and the properties of the flux close to production when you can neglect oscillation effects. And so uh, these studies of oscillations are usually based on comparison of the signal signal in far detector and close detector. In this way, you are removing a lot of uh, systematics and other uncertainties. So neutrinos are detected in Kamioka mine. And this is, uh, this is a super Kamiokanda detector. I don't remember. I probably I said already this is 50 kiloton water Cherenkov detector. This is a big cylinder of the size, I don't know, 40 meters uh, height and something like 40 meters uh, in, in diameter. It's nice acoustic in this. And before, you know, this uh, detector was filled uh, uh, by, by water, you know, they organized some concerts. And people are saying it's just amazing. Especially you have these photomultipliers, this kind of eye uh, glasses. Uh, and uh, so then public said, well, why not to continue with this series? Maybe uh, these neutrinos, uh, come on, just uh, go ahead with concerts. Probably they would be very profitable. I don't know. That's, Think about this. So uh, these are some parameters. You see the original protons have energy something like 50, uh, 30 GeVs. This is average energy of neutrinos. And so this kind of configuration is uh, kind of fitted in such a way that you are sitting in the first oscillation maximum to maximize oscillation effect. The second running experiment is minus plus. Before it was MINOS experiment, which was using a narrow beam. Now they're using quite wide. It's from 4 to 10 GeVs. This is the distance between the source and the detector. It's from Fermilab to Minnesota. Uh, and uh, nowadays, this experiment is aimed at searches for non-standard uh, uh, physics. And they also made the measurements of 2-3 mixing and uh, uh, delta M squared 2-3. So you saw some results from MINUS in the previous slide. So that was previous MINUS experiment. Actually, this is the detector. Uh, now, OPERA experiment, which they essentially finished and uh, now just analyzing data. And just recently, uh, uh, it was announcement that they observed the fifth tau neutrino event. This experiment is aimed at searches for tau neutrinos produced in oscillations of muon neutrinos. So muon neutrinos were produced at CERN, uh, and so they propagated from CERN to Grand Sasso Laboratory, here to Italy, and the, in Grand Sasso Laboratory, there is this opera experiment. And it's very difficult, because they want to explicitly see tau neutrino. For instance, MINOS experiment and uh, uh, Super Kamiakana, they see disappearance of muon neutrinos. Opera has aimed to see appearance of tau neutrinos, and so you need to see some signal and identify that you really uh, see tau neutrino interactions, production of tau lepton, and then the result of decay of tau lepton. So for a number of years, they see just five events. So uh, unfortunately, it doesn't contribute much to global fit and global picture, but it's important at some point to see that, uh, that uh, the tau neutrinos really appear. Uh, mini boon experiment, this one which produced anomaly, and then I will tell you about this later. So this is the uh, oscillation probabilities uh, in T2K experiment. This is new mu to new mu. This is what you are expecting at the function of energy. Uh, and this is new mu uh, to new E. So that's, that's dependence. Uh, oh, uh, and so essentially what this T2K observes is, is this interval and the next slide I will show you how it looks like. This is for probabilities and this is how the events look like. This is new mu disappearance uh, uh, exploration 
number of events as the function of reconstructed energy. This is what you are expecting without oscillations, and that what you see uh, due to oscillations. So the signal is really very strongly suppressed. Well, you see, it's, it's not a joke. I mean, it's not like neutrino is something rare somewhere, but this is this way. Now, here you see the ratio of oscillation to no, os no oscillation there. And you see here the dip. The experiment was planning to a large extent to discover 1, 3 mixing. Through the uh, appearance of electron neutrinos, so accelerator produces the flux of muon neutrinos, and then what was expected that these uh, muon neutrinos are oscillating into electron neutrinos due to 1, 3 mixing. So when experiment was planned, we didn't know what is the size of this 1, 3 mixing. So here you see the signal of this uh, uh, electron neutrino appearance as the function, of, again, of reconstruction energy. And now they see something like 27 events so, of, of this appearance, which actually gives very important, uh, uh, very important uh, result for, for our analysis. They actually give 1-3 mixing, which is bigger than the 1-3 mixing extracted from reactor experiments. And this is interesting, because this is something which testify probably from certain, for certain value of CP violation phase. Now, these are results from T2K for two different mass hierarchies. To some extent, you saw already this picture. Uh, and also, this is for inverted mass hierarchy. Uh, mixing is close to maximal, though MINOS uh, probably the only experiment which indicates substantial deviation or some deviation from maximal mixing. So that may be something like 0.4. Uh, and, and also here, the best fit point is somewhere here. And so the mass square difference is, uh, is, is here. Now, this is important result from T2K, which is the value of sine square theta 1, 3. Remember, this was small red part in the third uh, state, which I showed you before, something like 2%. As a function of phase delta. So this is phase delta, CP violation phase. And this is sine square theta 1, 3. And uh, there is a, this a Wigley uh, 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 form here. Because uh, in the first approximation, the result just uh, uh, determined by um, this is probability, appearance probability, nu mu go to nu e. And it is proportional to sine square theta 2, 3 multiplied by sine square uh, 2 theta 1, 3 multiplied by phase factor sine square f1, 3 over 2 with some corrections. But there are interference terms here which depend on phase delta. So the first term doesn't depend. And there are some interference terms which depend on cosine delta and also on sine delta. And it is due to this uh, interference term that you have this uh, wiggly, wiggly form. I'll come to this picture later also. Now, no experiment uh, is working now. And we are expecting the first results by the end of this year. So this is experiment in the US. The beam is at uh, Fermilab, and then to Usher Ewer with a distance uh, 810 kilometers. This is long baseline experiment. It's a 14 kiloton experiment. It's a kind of scintillator. Uh, and the average energy, is, so the energy interval is from 1 to 3 GeV. Typically. The aim of this experiment uh, to uh, detect and to study oscillations of muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos with the aim, again, to measure 1, 3 mixing, to probably determine uh, mass hierarchy. This is big distance, so you may have uh, still some matter effect, which actually uh, can help you to identify mass hierarchy, and hopefully to contribute somehow to CP violation measurements. Now, reactor experiments. This is kind of historical experiments. And neutrinos are produced in atomic reactors, uranium, thorium, chains of the decay, which produce anti-neutrinos. The flux of neutrinos is very small. We know that these are just beta decays, and, uh, and electron anti-neutrino appears in such a decay. The detection method is, is this. This is inverse beta decay. Uh, when electron antineutrinos are absorbed, produce positron and neutron, and both products are detected. So uh, to detect this, in many experiments, people are using also uh, gadolinium, 
which is very good capture of neutrons. So gadolinium captures neutron, go to excited state, then there's a de-excitation, the photons are emitted, and you detect this meat, uh, uh, these photons. Actually, you see this bluish light. What is this? Who knows? So this is one of the detectors surrounded by water. This is actually Cherenkov radiation. Now, there are three experiments, reactor experiments, which delivered recently the data uh, on measurements of 1-3 mixing. Actually, uh, uh, again, reactor experiments have a long story, history, and uh, in the last period, they mainly are focused to measure 1-3 mixing, and all these experiments are, have the distances or baselines to have a better sensitivity to 1-3 mixing and to delta M square, which is this 2.5, 10 to the minus 3 electron volts, which is the biggest split. Now, three experiments are Daya Bay, uh, Reno in Korea, this is in China, and this is double shoes experiment in, uh, in, uh, in France. And you see here the detectors. So, sorry, these are, reactor com these are reactors in China. So, and they have uh, three uh, regions of detection close to the detectors, again, to better control the flux and the remote one. And the distance is typically two kilometers. This is oscillation length for typical energy of uh, uh, neutrinos from atomic reactors. Now, Reno has uh, six reactors and uh, one uh, detector, I don't know, here or there. So, Double Shoes has uh, here, uh, uh, has uh, uh, reactors here, and uh, two detectors, one is uh, remote here, something like this one, almost 2,000 meters, and the close one, 280 meters. This detector started to operate just recently, at the end of last year, and so unfortunately they, the first analysis is based on just uh, uh, not comparison of near and far detector results, but on studies of energy spectrum of events. The biggest de detector is, is, is this one. They have the, the most power total power of reactors, and therefore the flux of antineutrinos is the biggest one, and they have also the biggest volume of, uh, of the detectors. So they produce the most precise result. And you see here result from Dia Bay. That is uh, the spectrum without oscillations. See, this is the spectrum which is produced by, by, uh, by a reactor. And this, what is the effect of oscillations? The experimental uh, errors are quite small. And so this is the ratio of uh, no oscillation to oscillation result. And you clearly here see kind of oscillatory curves. So, so just one of this, the, the, the first minimum, oscillation minimum. And here is again dependence L over E. And the, literally the points very nicely are, uh, you know, uh, match with this oscillatory curve. So no doubt that we see and we are, have discovered oscillations, right? This is determination of parameters, the most precise measurements of 1-3 mixing, and sin, here is sine squared 2 theta. It's something like uh, close to 0 0.9, and sine squared theta without 2 is something like 0 0.025 or something like this. And they also have measured delta M squared because then you have this access to the period of oscillation. This is the summary of all the data. This is from deep core. Unfortunately, uh, this is a result without uh, this uh, near detector, and therefore the error bars are quite big. This is from Reno experiment, and this is Dia Bay. And this is global fit of the data. So here we have for sine squared theta 1, 3 multiplied by 100. So it's uh, close to, say, 2.2. .2. So sine squared to theta is 2.2, .2, 10 to the minus 2, 2 percent, which I mentioned before. Questions? Yeah. yeah, sorry. So in the beginning of today's lecture, you mentioned about the uh, sign determination of M12 square from solar neutrino experiment, the yeah. fact that the uh, MSW resonance occurs, uh, gives us the opportunity to measure the sign. But if, you, if I remember the expression correctly, the, uh, in one side there was M12 square times a cosine factor. So uh, by knowing the sign of the potential, 
I can be sure of the uh, sine of m12 square times the cosine. So I missed the point how that sine of this cosine factor was determined so that I can uh, un unambiguously. So in this experiment, in reactor or in solar? In solar, in solar. Well, you see, in, in solar neutrinos, solar neutrinos, uh, one, three mixing enters as it is written here. And you can imagine what is this, since this is, uh, say, 0 0.02 square, and this is 1 minus 0 0.02 square, which is close to 1. And so actually solar neutrinos are not very much sensitive to 1-3 mixing at all. So there is still some indication that they see some effect, but this is less than 1 sigma. So essentially 1-3 mixing is, is, is not uh, uh, entering here. Okay. Now for, uh, for this it is a different story because here different delta m square enters in this business. So for solar neutrinos, delta m square 2, 1 is important, which is, which is uh, 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 very small and therefore oscillations are at very big distances. They have big oscillation lengths. Now, 1, 2 mixing and delta m square 2, 1 also affect this, but very little because the uh, typical oscillation lengths due to this one, two delta m square is something like 60 kilometers or even more, it's half 60 kilometers. These experiments are organized in such a way that the distance between the source and detector is two kilometers. So you see this again, the situation when to a large extent your uh, problem is reduced to two neutrino problem. So in the first approximation, you can just neglect this uh, solar sector analyzing these results. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I'm just curious. How do you actually fill a cylinder with 50 kilotons of water? How I fill cylinder? So, the first of all, this is uh, not a super K. So the, the yeah, yeah I'm, I'm asking for uh, super K. Super K, so... I know even more how they clean this. Not only they feel in, it's slow and there are some plots from, from down somewhere. Yeah, I don't know precisely where water comes. I think maybe, I don't know, along it's the wall. Huge but I, but of there water. are nice, nice, nice pictures when, you know, some guys are just, uh, you know, have the boat and they're, you know, going by the boat and cleaning some, some photomultipliers from down in this water. But what they are doing actually, they're cycling this water because they need to clean this. Again, sorry, I don't know these details. And uh, my other question is, why do they actually use in NOVA exactly gadolinium? Why they're using NOVA? Uh, why do they use gadolinium? In oh, the... not in NOVA. Gadolinium is, is he, gadolinium is in this reactor experiment. Oh, sorry. And but they, anyway, they, I mean, I'm the... curious why do they use exactly this? Gadolinium because uh, this is very nice neutron capture. So this is nuclei which capture neutrons. Uh, this is starting from, uh, from Ryan's experiment. So you have in the final state positron and neutron. So what you have usually, this annihilates and then produce some flash of the light, right? Very fast. Now neutron still kind of travels in, in your detector, scatters. And then he meets uh, this uh, nuclear of gadolinium. Uh, then this guy go to excited state. And then it emits a number of photons. And so you have two flashes. One, photons or gammas from uh, positron annihilation. And then from uh, decay, from the excitation of gadolinium. Uh, uh, so this is in this experiments. Actually, in the future, Juno experiment, they will use another way. They will use capture of neutron on proton with production of deuteron plus gamma. So they will detect this gamma. It's not, not everything, uh, all the experiments with this gadolinium. Thank you. Hey. So uh, reactors, reactor experiments are actually produced to some extent this reactor anomaly. Not even probably experiments, but theoreticians uh, made this confusion because uh, they made some new computations of the fluxes of, uh, of uh, reactor neutrinos. 
And the latest computations of the fluxes give something like three to 6% lower value of fluxes, no, higher, level, higher uh, uh, amount of fluxes, increase of the fluxes by three to 6%. So before it was nice agreement of data with uh, predictions, now theologians are saying, no, the fluxes are 6% higher. And therefore you have deficit. And uh, so that actually what is called reactor anomaly. Uh, and uh, so one of the explanation may be there are these sterile neutrinos again. And what is interesting that these sterile neutrinos may be the same which are needed to explain gallium anomaly I mentioned. So this is a big activity here to figure out what's going on. New computations of the, of the uh, of fluxes. Then it was realized that there are some features which people never realized before and that they were uh, actually even observed. So if you are interested, I can elaborate more. So global feed. We have a lot of data from all these experiments, the solar neutrino, Kamland, atmospheric, double shoes, Diabay, Minos, Rena, Antares, deep core, T2K. We use essentially two processes, oscillations and uh, adiabatic conversion to extract delta M square and theta. So you saw already this picture. This is uh, the summary of the results from this type of the analysis. Two spectra with this uh, small one three mixing. For antineutrinos, uh, they can be slightly different because of CP violation phase. If it is non-zero, then I said already before uh, th that borders can be uh, slightly moved. You see some certain symmetry, which I uh, 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 a little bit explained before. And uh, here you see uh, one of the uh, these global analysis. Actually, there are three groups in the world which are producing this whole analysis of all the data, all oscillation data. I know very well Michele Maltoni, he's one of the authors of this. And he, for instance, spent one year just to, uh, uh, to adjust atmospheric neutrino section in this global analysis. But then they put everything. So it's kind of hard work. You need to take into account, and you need to understand experiments. And experimentalists are not keen to give you the data. So what theoreticians are doing, they're trying you know, to cheat a little bit. So they're saying, OK, so let us make some assumptions. But then using these assumptions, we will fit the data in such a way that it has some agreement with what these theoreticians are giving. Actually, only a few open all the results. And so because you need to take into account not only statistical, it's clear, but also systematics and then correlations between different systematic errors. And this is really a huge business to do these things. So this is the result of global feed. They didn't do analysis of data, including the latest. So it's the end of last year. And you see here one to mixing, which we have discussed, something sine squared theta 0.3. This is uh, delta m squared, 7.5, 10 to the minus 5. This is uh, theta uh, 2, 3. And there are two possibilities, depending on mass hierarchy, actually, because here um, red is for normal hierarchy and blue for inverted. You see there are some changes here. However, uh, this is not statistically significant. One sigma is one, two sigma is four. So there's uh, differences within uh, kind of small, small variations. What else here? This is... Uh, one three mixing, which is close to what Dia Bay is, is giving because this is kind of dominant experiment. They have the best accuracy. And this is interesting because they see some hint for CP violation phase. And uh, again, uh, not very significant. You know, it's not even two sigma from zero. So zero is here, zero phase. So it's something here and uh, the, the, the strongest uh, is for inverted hierarchy. However, they kind of exclude some region when this phase is pi over two, something like again, 2.5 sigma, disfavoring this range. It doesn't mean yet anything. So about masses, using oscillation data, using delta M square, actually we can put this very interesting bound. M2 over M3, if you take normal mass hierarchy, is, should be bigger than square root of uh, uh, of this delta m squared 2, 1, and delta m squared 3, 2. And this is, the, the equality is when m1 is 0. So it's clear then you get this. If m1 is non-zero, then it should be uh, bigger. So this ratio actually gives you something like 0.18. 
And uh, that means that neutrinos, if they have hierarchy, it may still happen that neutrinos are quasi-degenerate. All three neutrinos are close to each other. But at least you can claim that uh, the hierarchy of neutrino masses is the weakest one among all other fermions. So this is for top quarks, this is for down quarks, this is for charged leptons, and this is what you have for neutrinos. So this state is either here or even closer. And the last, uh, the, the, the lightest state may be even zero, you may have zero mass. And so what's next? Next is uh, to uh, measure, to, to identify mass hierarchy, to, to determine CP violating phase, to measure very precisely deviation of 2-3 mixing from maximal. And this is very important measurement, because if it is maximal, that certainly testify for the symmetry behind this picture. And also it's important to compare, for instance, this deviation of 2-3 mixing from maximal with 1-3 mixing, because things may con be connected, especially if you are uh, invoking some symmetry to explain this data. So it's important to have very precise measurements of deviation, if it exists, of 2-3 mixing from maximal. Then, of course, uh, we need still to know what is, uh, identify what is the mass hierarchy, what is the type of the mass spectrum. So the spectrum still can be very hierarchical, or it may be quasi-degenerate, so that all three states are around, say, 0.2 uh, electron volts with small relative split. Uh, uh, then absolute scale of neutrino mass, nature of neutrino mass. Are neutrinos Dirac and Majorana? Remember, I never mentioned before if neutrinos I'm speaking are Majorana or Dirac. Not, it's not accidental, because all this pattern, which I have discussed before, is the same for Majorana and Dirac neutrinos, the same. And this is due to ultra-relativistic neutrinos and the f character of neutrinos in all these experiments. And uh, uh, because of in this oscillation process, there is no change of chirality or helicity. So essentially, neutrinos like uh, bosonic particles appear here. So there's no uh, kind of uh, sensitivity to the nature of neutrino mass. Yeah? So I will discuss this later. So the question is how we distinguish uh, Majorana and Dirac. So it's different type of the experiments. It's double beta decay experiment, which uh, uh, is sensitive to the nature of neutrino mass. Now, this related question is lepton number violation, because if neutrinos are Majorana, then you expect violation of lepton number, and in particular by uh, two units. So that's what we can search for. The question about existence of new neutrino states, because you saw that there are some indications that maybe we need to, uh, to consider some more neutrino uh, species to, to explain the data. The open question if there is some symmetry or no symmetry behind this pattern of neutrino mixing. So it's nice. It, it's, so when you see this, you actually immediately recognize that something interesting, right? Some very symmetric in, in, in this pattern. Um, I didn't say much about neutrino interaction. So mostly we have discussed neutrino propagation. But of course, there is a lot of activity in studies of neutrino interactions. This is also important for even oscillation experiments. And uh, uh, at high energies, you have deep inelastic scattering. At low energies, quasi-elastic scattering. But there's intermediate range where still there are big uncertainties, that's called resonance region or one pine production, etc. So there is a big activity in several experiments aimed at very precise measurements of uh, cross-sections of neutrinos. You do not learn much about neutrinos from these studies. You more learn about hadrons and interactions with hadrons. But these are important experiments, which you, and the results will be used in future oscillation studies. Um, now, some exotic interactions. Again, so we discussed a little bit non-standard neutrino interactions only in this respect, but it doesn't seem that there's any deviation from the standard model. And so, for time being, it's more like uh, hadron physics, which is involved here, and need to be clarified. So, probably this will be the last topic of, of my lectures, and I will discuss uh, a race for hierarchy and CP violation. But before I start this, uh, if you have some questions, Okay, so what is this mass hierarchy? You saw these uh, two pictures and they actually differ by the change of the sign of delta m squared. 
If you change the sign of this uh, delta M squared, then the resonance due to one three splitting will be in neutrino or in anti-neutrino channel. So these are two spectra. And uh, what are the properties? This type of the spectrum, normal mass hierarchy, with although quite uh, mild hierarchy, uh, resembles what we have in quark sector and in charge lab. So it's quite similar. If this is realized, then that may be kind of indication that we deal with uh, a CSO mechanism, uh, quark lepton symmetry, and some unification. So this type, of course, there is no proof that if you see normal mass hierarchy, this is the evidence for unification of quark and leptons. But still, it's kind of indication. This is probably even more interesting situation because in the case of inverted mass hierarchy, the split is here in delta M squared is the same, but relative delta M over M is something like 10 to the minus two. So these two states are really degenerate, right? Or quasi degenerate. And certainly some symmetry should be behind this. So what, what, why, what's the reason that two states are very close to each other? So it may happen that then neutrino mass spectrum is organized like one pseudo Dirac neutrino and one Majorana neutrino. And then you have some small split here in this state. It may testify for flavor symmetries and often people use this Le minus L mu minus L tau symmetry to explain this type of the spectrum. Now rays for mass hierarchy. There are different uh, experiments and phenomenology of a neutrino mass hierarchy is very rich. Actually, many things depend on the type of mass hierarchy. And you see here that you can uh, measure neutrino mass hierarchy using matter effect on one three mixing. So depending on hierarchy, you have resonance in neutrino or anti-neutrino channel. So for this, you can use atmospheric neutrinos, experiments like PINGU, ORCA, uh, INO. You can use long baseline experiments, accelerator experiments, and also supernova neutrinos to identify uh, mass hierarchy. Let me tell you, so there's a, this big deal with mass hierarchy. But if tomorrow neutrino burst will arrive from supernova, I think probably in three days I will tell you what is the mass hierarchy of neutrinos. So, you know, it's kind of interesting situation. And already more than 20 neutrino bursts are approaching us. Neutrino burst from galactic supernova. What we have detected in 87A was not a supernova in our galaxy. It was in large Magellanic cloud. The distance was big. So we are expecting that if uh, next supernova will be from our galaxy, number of events will be big, and maybe very big even. And so using this number of events and making analysis, you can extract information uh, about mass hierarchy just seeing where Earth matter effect is in neutrino or in anti-neutrino channel. Now, another method to determine mass hierarchy is to measure delta M square at reactors. It's another proposal. Uh, then cosmology. Cosmology gives um, bound on the sum of neutrino masses. And therefore, you can distinguish mass hierarchy if uh, you know, your sensitivity to this sum will be less than 0.1. Because in the case of normal mass hierarchy, you expect that the sum of neutrino masses will be 0 0.05 electron volt, something like this, which is the mass of the heaviest neutrino, and two others are light, right? If the hierarchy is inverted, then you expect two neutrinos with this mass, and so you expect that the sum of neutrino masses will be 0.1. So if cosmology would be uh, sensitive to this sum of neutrino masses, and the present bounds are around, say, 0.2, point, say, five electron volts. Still there are big uncertainties. But they promise that they do much better work, maybe even in, in five, 10 years. And so they may be sensitive or to give some kind of serious indication toward the mass hierarchy. And uh, also double beta decay. Neutrino less double beta decay uh, is sensitive to the mass hierarchy. And I will show you probably this if I have time. So why it is important? As I said, the rich phenomenology. Of course, it is important for theoretical implications. And it is also important for further measurements of CP violation, because various uncertainties disappear if you know precisely what is the mass hierarchy for measurements of CP violation phase. So uh, the idea is that probably first we will measure uh, 
mask hierarchy established, and then we'll go for, for, uh, for CP, although some experiments are planned to do both things simultaneously. So tell me how much humanity will pay for identification of mask hierarchy? Can you have some idea? And to CP violations, so tell me, what do you think? So the cost of the experiments I was saying, this reactor experiments, I say 20, 40, 60 millions. Now, uh, Super K cost more, of course, uh, than, um, so now, that nowadays experiments are already 100 millions. What do you think? How much we should pay for, for mask hierarchy? <laughs> and for CP. Let me tell you for, about CP. Uh, one of the experiments which people are now promote uh, very uh, strongly is in the United States is Dune experiment. I will show you some pictures. That kind of Dune experiment and uh, J, uh, what is this? Uh, <laughs> LBNF, Dune. LBNF, uh, uh, a long baseline neutrino facility. So, which means the beam will be from Fermilab and then it will be to uh, home stake. Uh, that will cost at least one billion. I don't know, Michael maybe know precisely. So Dune, how much it will cost? Dune experiment. It uh, well, accelerate, so two billions, right? So I think, right? Okay, so how about mask hierarchy? <laughs> So what is two billion, you know? Approach to some rich guy, say, look, we name by your name this kind of, we'll call, you know, this hierarchy, and this will be forever, no? I said, just. So anyway, um, let me speak a little bit about supernova neutrinos. And you know what I will do? So, of course, I have a lot of material. You understand that uh, I'm trying to adjust my, uh, my, my lectures to, to the audience. What I will do, I will just, you know, stop in, in 10 minutes where I stop, you know. But then I will do the following. I will flash many, many hundred slides. And if you find something interesting, you will say, okay, stop, please tell me what, what, what is that. So, chairman, don't worry. <laughs> I've been in time. So, supernova had no time to speak on this. There are beautiful effects, collective effects, which is very interesting, you know. Supernova neutrinos are produced when you have collapse uh, uh, of the star gravitational one. So you may have the collapse to neutron star or to black hole, and that produces actually uh, 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 neutrinos, huge fluxes of neutrinos, and essentially all the energy which is released gravitational when you do this, uh, uh, when this collapse occurs, essentially is released in the form of neutrinos. And uh, 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 so all types of neutrinos are emitted. You first have new E peak, this is so-called neutronization peak in the early time, but then you produce the spectra of all three, of all neutrino species and antineutrinos. So you have something like this for neutrinos, if this is energy. This is something for antineutrinos. And then you have the fluxes of uh, uh, new mu, new tau, and uh, corresponding antineutrinos. And they are the, uh, the largest. So these neutrinos are something like from, say, from essentially from 0 to 20 MeVs. This is slightly higher. And that can be up to 40 MeVs with maximum somewhere, say, 20 MeVs. Here probably uh, less, something like uh, 16 MeVs. This is, this is even less, like 15 MeVs. So this is the spectrum which is produced by neutrinos. Now what happens with these neutrinos? What happens is the following. The flux of these neutrinos in the central part is so high that you should take into account neutrino-neutrino scattering. And then the problem becomes extremely complicated. I mean, some, if someone wants to you know, break his mind, one can work on this. Uh, the point is that the problem becomes nonlinear. And then you need to take into account all these kind of transformations and uh, so the nonlinear problem is uh, often very, very complicated. So interesting effect is that you will have even matter effects which are off diagonal. So matter effects in off diagonal uh, elements of the, uh, of the uh, Hamiltonian. So 
extremely interesting, very complicated, and still we don't know what is the outcome. So I was working on this painting a couple of years, and we have found that it may be kind of effect of spectral split. So suddenly, due to this collective effect and some range of energies, for instance, like this, the spectra of different neutrino types just flip. Electron neutrinos become muon neutrinos, muon neutrinos become electron neutrinos, and in contrast of MSW effect, it's just in very sharp range here occurs. It's not clear because there are some instabilities and people uh, see more and more effects if these collective effects are really realized or not. Anyway, so there's some uncertainties here. Then there's a region of MSW effects where the density is relatively low. It's below, say, 10 to the 4 gram per cubic centimeter. And the picture of transformations is here very clear, so very clear. Now, we had already observation of one supernova, as I said, supernova 87A. Unfortunately, we have just 19 events, and it's difficult to extract any information if oscillations occurred or not. And the point is that oscillation effect is always proportional to difference of the fluxes. If you have oscillations of electron neutrino to muon neutrino, then eventually the effect is proportional to difference of these fluxes. Because if fluxes are the same, you do not see any oscillation effect, right? So unfortunately, again, for antineutrinos, this difference of the fluxes, electron antineutrinos and muon antineutrinos, for instance, is something like 10%. And of course, how can you extract something useful if you have effect which is below 10% and you have just 19 events? So again, we are expecting new supernova, galactic one, and, uh, and so hopefully we will see many interesting things from that. So these neutrinos have this undergo adiabatic conversion, and with this big 1-3 mixing, everything is very adiabatic. So just we know these results, what happens there with very high accuracy, apart from the fact that it may be shock wave propagating uh, from uh, inner part to outer, and then it breaks adiabaticity. You may even observe effect of shock wave on studying neutrino spectrum in time, but also in energy. So it happens that shock wave will reflect modification of the spectrum uh, at different energies. And the energy where the effect becomes important changes with time. So you can see some interesting effect that you have spectrum, the text spectrum of events. And then it changes, say, from low energies to high energies. So you can even trace shock wave propagating inside the supernova. So then neutrinos arrive at the surface of the Earth. As the solar neutrinos, they split and start to oscillate inside the Earth. And this can be used to identify mass hierarchy. So I will skip many uh, uh, slides because that's uh, details. And if you ask me uh, what, what's going on here, uh, you see two resonances which are involved. And you can use adiabaticity and to trace immediately what happens. For instance, here, electron neutrinos are just be transformed to mu3. Now, you expect effects like permutation of the spectrum. So suppose this is original spectrum. Then after crossing MSW region, you will get uh, this exchange of the flavor. And uh, now let me comment on, on uh, hierarchy. In fact, there are many effects, not just one Earth matter effect, but many effects which uh, can be the consequences of different mass hierarchies. But let me just to discuss this earth matter effect, because it's easy. If you have two detectors in different places, and you measure the same spectrum, and you see some difference, then you conclude that there's a certain matter effect. Or oscillations produce some kind of wiggly distortion of the spectrum, uh, and you expect to observe something like that. So this is without earth matter effect. If just neutrinos are arriving during the day, so the effect is small. But if uh, your detector is shielded by the Earth, then you would expect to see something like this. And even using just one detector and observing this type of wiggly behavior, you can conclude that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there's Earth matter effect in one channel or another. But what is interesting, that it depends on mass hierarchy. And uh, if the Earth matter effect is observed in antineutrino channel only, then that is proof of a normal mass hierarchy. So if you ask me, I can elaborate this later more. If it is uh, in neutrino channel, then it is inverted mass hierarchy. So um, there is another suggestion to use reactor neutrinos to identify mass hierarchy. So you see what happens. 
the depths of oscillations between state three and one is two times smaller than the depths of oscillation between, so it's two times bigger than the depths of oscillation between three and two. Because the depths of oscillation, suppose we consider the oscillations between this state and that one, is proportional to the product of this red part and this red part, okay? Because if there's no red part here, then there's no oscillations of electron neutrinos. Now here, amount of electron neutrinos is two times bigger, and therefore the depths of oscillation between this and that will be two times bigger than between this and this. So you have this depths of three one is approximately two depths of three two, okay? Now, in the case of normal mass hierarchy, the split one three is bigger than the split than two three. Okay, and therefore the frequency of three one should be bigger than frequency than three two. The frequency is inversely proportional to the split. Now, oh, it's proportional to the split, sorry. So in the case of inverted hierarchy, you have an uh, opposite situation that uh, uh, because here the state one and this split is, is uh, smaller than the split between two and three. So suppose you use a reactor experiment and you see some wiggly picture and then you do Fourier analysis. And you do Fourier analysis and in the case of uh, normal mass hierarchy, and this is the frequency, you expect the situation that uh, the peak here is smaller than the peak there because of this inequality and the opposite situation uh, in the case of inverted mass hierarchy. So think about this, it's easy to understand just uh, knowing such a situation and these two. So just to see where the big peak is and where the small one, you can identify mass chiral. Now, uh, to do this, new experiment, uh, even several experiments actually are planned, and one is this Juno, which is Chinese experiment, and this uh, year, it was kind of a serious breakthrough because, uh, uh, so essentially this exper experiment is approved, so you expect to observe this type of the pattern, and the red is for normal, so uh, blue is for normal, and red is for, for inverted mass hierarchy, and you need to distinguish these two curves, essentially. So that's, that's the problem. Now, the experiment will have, uh, it will be organized in the, in the mind, something like 700 meters depth. It will have distance from complex of reactors, something like 53 kilometers. So you are sitting essentially in the first oscillation minimum due to one, two oscillations, huge power of reactors. And they will use 20 kiloton uh, scintillator detector, which is shown here. So you need really to figure out what's going on. The biggest problem is that you really need to have very good energy resolution, right? Because you need to essentially be sensitive to this small wiggly uh, curves, and you, one needs to uh, achieve something like 3% uh, energy resolution at one MeV here, you know, it's 3% uh, energy. This is the big challenge of this experiment. If they manage, then they will manage. So the experiment is planned to start something in 2020. There's an, another experiment also um, uh, planned in Korea, which is uh, Reno uh, 50, kind of continuation of the experiments they had already now. Now another way is to, and probably I will stop this as final, uh, what I want to say, is to use atmospheric neutrinos and propagation inside the, inside, the, inside the Earth. So here you see the probabilities in different channels. Um, this is, let me see, I have some, uh, 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 so this is Px and x can be mu and uh, uh, so some and to, uh, going to mu. This is also x to mu. This is for uh, neutrinos, and this is for neutrinos, for anti-neutrinos. So you see here the difference between hierarchy is uh, normal is solid and inverted is dashed. And uh, here one sees some enhancement of oscillations uh, uh, in one channel and here's in another channel. So this is for anti-neutrinos and this is for neutrinos. Sorry, this is for, for neutrinos and this is for anti-neutrinos. So this is MSW resonance. This is enhancement due to MSW resonance. And uh, uh, depending on mass hierarchy, this enhancement occurs in neutrino or anti-neutrino channel. So essentially, going from uh, one hierarchy to another, you permute neutrino and anti-neutrino channels. 
That's what do you expect for oscillations of new E go to new E. So this is the peak. Uh, that would you expect if you have normal mask hierarchy. And if it is inverted mask hierarchy, then you expect such a pattern. Again, this is energy of neutrino, zenith angle. Energies are 2, 3, 4, 20 GEVs. Actually, you know this line. You saw this already in before. This corresponds to the border between core of the Earth and the mantle of the Earth. And these are due to parametric uh, resonance. Different channel, new E go to new mu. This is what you expect in the case of normal mask hierarchy. This in the case of inverted mass hierarchy. So you need just to distinguish these pictures. This is for new mu to new mu. And uh, for this, uh, you need to have measurements of atmospheric neutrino flux with energies at least below than 6 GeVs, right? Because all these kind of patterns are around 6 GeVs, 6, uh, 5 GeVs. Unfortunately, you cannot do this with uh, deep core because deep core has uh, uh, energy threshold, say, 10, uh, 10 GV, 10, 20 GVs. And uh, because of this, there is a new plan of to have a uh, uh, PING experiment, which is more dense array of photomultipliers with lower threshold around, uh, say, 1, 3 GVs. And uh, then what uh, this experiment can, be, can observe is the following. So this is... This is, let me say, this is, not, this is the quantity which we call distinguishability between two mass hierarchies. So this is the difference of number of events in different uh, beans for normal and inverted hierarchy. And you see the maximal effect is around, say, 10 to 14 uh, uh, GeVs and in this range of, of, of the angles. This is for two different energy resolutions. Actually, these plots have been obtained from the nice plots I have shown you before with these kind of images of the Earth. And of course, cheating was because that were the plots in terms of neutrino energies and neutrino direction. However, in the experiment, we are not measuring neutrino energies. At the moment, we are measuring something which is secondary. This is what neutrinos are produced. So these plots are smearing plots out of what you saw before. But still, you see some effect here. So literally, what is shown here is a number of events in each of the beans for uh, inverted hierarchy minus normal hierarchy over square root of normal mass hierarchy. This is kind of statistical significance in each of these beans. Concluding, let me say that uh, Pingu experiment, uh, probably I have shown, or I have some pictures of this. So, so that spingo will be, will be here. Uh, they will observe 10 to the 5 events every year, 10 to the 5 events. So to some extent, statistic is not a big deal. So the most important is to understand uh, systematics and the procedure of reconstruction of, uh, of the events. So I think I stop at this point. There are big discussions of, uh, of CP violation. And this is what I told you before. So please ask me the questions, and then we'll just, uh, you know, you will see how many other slides, and if you select something interesting, you can ask. So questions to this part. So a question of technical nature. You said that if tomorrow there is a supernova explosion, you can say in three days that uh, the hierarchy is one or the other. My one uh, objection would be, aren't most of these things switched off at the moment? And wasn't this the same case in 1987? And shouldn't there be some sort of that, that, that would be coordination? That, that would be disaster. So there's kind of a warning uh, procedures. And uh, um, you see, unfortunately, you will uh, see the light later. <laughs> the nutrients are right. So you cannot. And the point is that you see the light from this super host, you can see this uh, unless there is a dust. Uh, because uh, neutrinos are coming immediately from, from the central parts, and the light appears when you have uh, expansion of envelope enough. So it maybe it takes some, some hours. Uh, so there's a warning system, at least if one detector sees something that others uh, are, can they inform each other. That would be a disaster, of course, waiting for for so many years. Actually, we had no supernova here 50 years or so, already 50 years of observation, and that would be just really. But uh, Super-K is able to detect, so they are 
uh, operating than some small detectors. Even small detectors like, uh, like Juno will, will pro produce a, a, a lot of stuff. Relatively small, it's not, very, it's not small, right? Now, for, hopefully SNO plus will just start to operate and they will see some signal also. So not many, so that's kind of a dangerous phase. Actually, ice cube can see the signal, but they will see not individual neutrinos. They will just see because the flux is so big, and some neutrinos uh, will be interacting very close to, to, to uh, these uh, PMTs, and they will produce observable signals. So, so they will see kind of a flash of the, of the light in the detector. The detector will shine, this kilometer cube stuff. Yeah. So I have a quick question about uh, the uh, collider neutrino experiments. You yeah. said that they're, uh, they shoot them off beam, or off the beam axis. Yeah. Are, are they just going to uh, fix these at one angle and leave it there, or are they able to actually go down and hit their end of their well, beam with a hammer and move Unfortunately, it? you cannot do this unless you move the detector, right? So it's, it's the de detectors well, over, are planned. Well, over those distances, I mean, a little bit of deviation. Some kilometers. The distance is not, it's not a joke. It's, it's yeah, not yeah, it's a, it's a kilometer, hard thing to yeah, do. Something yeah. like this. Uh, no, okay. it's a... Um, you, probably you can, in some cases, uh, Wiggle the uh, beam line. change a little bit beam, yeah. That you can do. So if a, a few days is the minimum time scale where we might know what the uh, mass hierarchy is, what is the maximum time scale at which we'll, we'll find <laughs> out? No, it's like a more... You see, again, so... Uh, uh, Experimentalists will release data, and if I see some wiggly distortion in, say, in spectrum of uh, antineutrinos, then I make this conclusion. So it's, uh, I, I'm not going even probably to even to analyze. I just ask experimentalists, give me the, the energy spectrum of neutrinos and antineutrinos. Unfortunately, for antineutrinos, it's easy. For neutrinos, uh, 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 it's difficult. Usually, the number of neutrino events is, is less because it's more difficult to detect neutrinos. So, I mean, if there is no supernova, then obviously there are experiments to, to try to measure the mass hierarchy, which hierarchy, inverted or normal ordering, um, what is the longest time scale okay, that so, we can go without knowing? So, that's, that's important. This is an important question. Actually, this is a serious even political question, let me say. I mean, scientific politics. Um, so, uh, you see... The, there's a competition now. There are two major methods. One is to use uh, reactor neutrinos. Juno will start to work uh, in 2020. They need something like six years if everything is okay. So using Juno experiment, um, uh, Reno will be a little bit late. Say in the middle of 2020s, you may know this. Now the story with Spingu and Orca may be faster, but you know, it also depends uh, on, on, on the time scale of uh, funding of this experiment. They aim to start to build experiment in, uh, not build, I mean to, to go to this PINGO proposal in uh, 2018, 1-8. And they need two seasons to put uh, these uh, additional strings. So this procedure is, you know, there are some equipments in, in Antarctica. They melt the, the, the ice and they put these strings. And uh, with present uh, uh, kind of speed of this putting, they need two, two seasons, two summers, say, two Antarctica says. So this, which means that they also can start in 2020. Now, they may need even less time. If everything is okay, they may produce already some, uh, uh, actually I have to even depend on some time here. Uh, so that's uh, how Pingu is going to to measure, this is confidence level and this number of years. So in two years, they may have already four sigma result in two years. And this is a competition. I mean, people are nervous, you know. It's, now next, uh, what, what's next? Uh, next is um, if accelerator experiments. You see the accelerate, accelerator experiments, NOVA plus, um, plus T2K, they are struggling. They're still trying to, you know, to, 
to collect some sigmas. They may have some, some indications. Already there are some differences. You saw these results for normal and inverted hierarchy. But it will not be statistically significant. They may come up with, say, two sigma at most, I think, in, in, uh, in uh, maybe five, six years. No, we'll start really to release data now. And then joint analysis may produce something. Now, dedicated experiments like this Dune, uh, so, uh, and uh, this uh, LBNF Dune experiment, which is kind of the main major experiment, I mean, American community is kind of uh, big one is built around this. They may release results in, can you guess when? <laughs> eh? 2035, if everything is okay, no? You, they will start early, yeah, no, I mean to release results. So the point is that they still need to have some time to, to operate and even neutrino, anti-neutrino more. So how many of you will be, you know? <laughs> no. So I, I, I don't know if I will be around, but... Uh, so that's, that's, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is why people like this idea. <laughs> you know, to, to be kind, to be sure in your career, you know, to have. So, yeah? Other questions? Yeah. Oh, now here. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, in a few slides before that uh, uh, these two kind of uh, neutrino mass hierarchy uh, can be a hint. For instance, the, the normal hierarchy can be a clue for the CISO mechanism. Can you explain that more a little bit? Because I still well, don't quite uh, see that. There's no uh, kind of, of course, firm. You can get even, if you have CISO mechanism, you have inverted mass hierarchy also. According to the CISO mechanism, the mass of neutrino is, uh, say, m Dirac square over some Majorana masses. And in three neutrino case, you need to have these matrices, right? You have matrices, this one over m. So what is important that uh, if you have grand unification, which is actually CISO mechanism indicate toward grand unification, it's also together with grand unification, then these Dirac mass matrices of neutrinos, they are somehow related to Dirac mass matrices of other fermions, for instance, U quarks. Then what you have is the following. So let me write it in, in this way, M D uh, transponent, and here is in denominator. So this is very hierarchical, and this is very hierarchical. So you actually expect quite hierarchical mass uh, matrix of neutrinos, uh, unless you do something crazy with this structure of this Majorana mass matrix, you typically get quite strong mass hierarchy, normal mass hierarchy of neutrinos, just because this is inherited from uh, quarks and leptons, charged leptons. Or some. Uh, so if uh, the neutrino flux is uh, equal from all sides, why do we have uh, one water detectors in the form of a cylinder and others like SNO in the form of a sphere? I didn't catch your question. So what? So what? in uh, in, a, in in the case when we have a s cylinder with water cylinder, to yeah. detect neutrinos, when they come from the side, they travel less in the water than if they come from above. Uh, and on the other hand, we also have the SNO detector, which is spherical. Yeah. So why do we have two different shapes of detectors? Um. What's the benefit? Fr fr in fr frankly, you know, you may have even a water uh, detector. So I don't know actually precise the region, uh, reason for this. Probably for, for water sharing of and a bigger, bigger volume, probably this cylinder is more preferable. Actually, Hyper-K will also have some kind of cylindric form. Hyper-K, this is future, they will have even two cylinders of this type. So, of this type. So, the answer that I have no answer, good answer to your question. Uh, I, I may guess, but I don't want to do this. 
it's more symmetric, of course, this you know cylinder, and maybe to some extent it's easy to analyze. I don't know. Maybe Michael knows this the answer. Yeah, I think it's just purely technical. It's easier to hang photomultipliers on a vertical wall than on a sphere. No, this um, I don't know why. And the, the sphere is, is kind of also trivial. They have this in uh, SNO plus. They had this in right. Boracino. They had this in Kamran. But for snow, there's a specific reason why it's a sphere, which which is that they had heavy water. Yeah. So there's a bag of heavy water. No, but there's also which scintillators. In, yeah. which, if I remember correctly, sits in the middle of a cylindrical container of ordinary water, right? SNO. Uh, yes. Well, I don't remember, actually. There is some, actually, surf, there's even bigger volume, which is filled by usual water. That's so right. But, I but think it's that's also cylindrical. Cylindr I don't know, maybe there are some constructions, but I don't think <laughs> that there is any water kind of, for, at least for this. So it may be somehow related to what also Michael said, that it's, uh, in one case, we are using uh, water. Maybe it's water is easy. And of course, if you have cylinder, it's easy to analyze results. Maybe. But it's not a big deal, really. You know, it's, uh, So I think you briefly mentioned that with uh, neutrino less double beta decay, you can also be sensitive to the hierarchy problem. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So now I start, you know, to already to let, let, let me let me do this, and then you will. This is the, the topic with uh, CP violation. How CP violation interference uh, uh, effect occurs here? Some information about uh, CP violation. Now how to measure CP violation? And you see different experiments. Now, even present data, I said already, give some indication for CP violation. And this is what we obtained from, uh, from T2K. Remember, this is a sine square theta 1, 3. And this is what we get from uh, reactor experiments, determination of uh, 1, 3 mixing. Reactors do not depend on CP phase. And you see the overlap is here and here. And the overlap is when the phase is minus pi over 2. So let me go further, because uh, there is somewhere. So that's how CP is determined presently. This is the picture of all these kind of experiments, Ice Cube, Deep Core, Pingu, Super Pingu, Orca, and Mica, with different threshold. So that I have shown. This is how CP should be determined. So these are pictures for different CP phases. Uh, now let's go further. So this is Dune experiment I mentioned, right? So this is in US, long baseline experiment with the aim to detect CP violation phase and also mass hierarchy. This is what will be in 2000, producing results in 2035. Uh, so these are hyper -kamiakan. You see the two cylinders uh, aligning in this way. NOVA, and this is INO, which I haven't uh, discussed here, but if you ask. This is how to measure absolute scale of neutrino mass. And this spectrometer will start to operate hopefully next year. I mean, there is so big delay. And they will have sensitivity to neutrino mass point two electron walls, they can put this bound. There's also another project uh, to measure neutrino mass. So this is, Catherine will be sensitive uh, to this. Cosmological bounds, now nah, nah, this is physics related to Dirac and Majorana, you can ask me. Uh, so this is double beta decay. So double beta decay measures so-called effective mass of electron neutrinos. And uh, so let me just show you the picture, and then if you ask more questions, I can explain. These are the bands which actually obtained using oscillation data, information from oscillation data, for this effective Majorana mass. And uh, a neutrino less double beta decay is proportional, probability is proportional to square of this mass as the function of the lightest mass of neutrino. So these two bands correspond to inverted mass hierarchy and these to normal mass hierarchy. And so if a future neutrino less double beta decay, for instance, put the bound at this level, they will exclude inverted mass hierarchy. Now, if you want to listen more, then, then I can explore, say more because now it's time. Uh, by the way, so I will be here next week. And uh, so if you want to discuss more, and the chairman said, no, I will not give you to speak more, to give more lectures so that, uh, yeah. So, so let, me, let me continue, and you will see. So this is, uh, these are some experiments on double beta decay, Gerda, uh, then Core, Exo. So this experiment will be very sensitive. 
Now that's some explanation. And these are sterile neutrinos with some anomalies. Mini boon. This is the scheme. And you know why I have I just skipped this? I, I always had kind of temptation, you know, to include more material. But then I said, so if I believe that that say after a few years this will be still, you know, existing anomaly or things disappear, then why I should teach, you know, to spend my time and your time on something which is not existing and will, you know, disappear in a few years or so. So I made kind of selection of this type. I discussed mostly existing and solid results. So just not to, you know, to take your time for various speculations. I mostly didn't discuss any kind of the theory as, as, you, as you observe. Um, so this is, again, about this anomaly. I had some slides about cosmic neutrinos which is kind of interesting, and also neutrinos and LHC. And I skip this because I'm not sure that we will see something which is related to neutrinos at LHC, although there is a huge activity in this field. But if you ask me, I can explain you. And one can see some other things here. Let me see how so many, many things you can see in principle. And there's a lot of speculation on this. Uh, and some mechanisms of neutrino mass generation, if you want. Oh, this is very interesting that you can see probably some same signed leptons, which will indicate that this is famous new MSM model, which is the economical one. Let's see what else, parameters of this model. And then some theories, some funny things, and uh, things which I have already shown you. And I'll stop completely at this point. Thank you very much.